Whether you can't get out of bed in the morning, your energy crashes throughout the day, or you're a biohacker looking to optimize your energy, productivity, and focus, this podcast is for you. I am Dr. Evan Hirsch, and I will be your host on your journey to resolving fatigue and optimizing your energy. And we'll be interviewing some of the top leaders in the world on fatigue resolution. Welcome. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Fix Your Fatigue podcast, the home of the Energy MD method, where we help leaders and executives take their energy to the next level so they can have more success and fun in every aspect of their personal and professional lives. So super excited to talk about all that stuff today with my good friend, Dr. Tracy Gappin. So let's go ahead and meet him. So Dr. Gappin is a surgeon, world-renowned health and performance expert, and the founder of the Gappin Institute for High Performance Health. He is also a thought leader, a professional speaker, and the author of the best-selling books, Mail 2.0 and Codes of Longevity. His passion and purpose is providing executives and entrepreneurs a personalized plan to better energy, better brain power, better body, and even better sex. He's the creator of the N1 High Performance Health Program that provides the data-driven approaches you need to optimize your brain and body for peak performance. And today, we're going to be talking about a systems approach to superhuman energy. Dr. Tracy, thanks so much for hanging out with me today. Uh, Doc, thanks so much for having me. Today. I'm excited to be here with you. It's been a long awesome. time coming. It has been. Yes, yeah, exciting. For sure. So uh, let's start first uh, talking about the men's health pandemic. What is that? Yeah. So, you know, I've coined it the men's health pandemic that's getting no attention. Um, it is a crisis that um, has been going on for over 30 years now. And I'm talking about testosterone. So there are three huge studies. One was here in the U.S., the uh, male Massachusetts aging study. And then there were two studies in Europe, uh, Sweden and Finland. These three longitudinal studies, all, uh, all three of them ran for over 20 years, and they all showed the same identical finding, and that was that testosterone levels have plummeted by over 30%, and free testosterone, which is what we actually really care about, has declined by over 45%. So let me, let me emphasize that for a moment. If you have a 50 year old guy today, what we're saying is that his free testosterone level is 45% lower than a 50 year old guy 20 years ago, massive wow. decline. And, and, you know, I, I want to clarify that there's a little bit of a misconception that, that testosterone is not just about sex and libido and performance and building muscle. Testosterone is about cardiovascular health. It's about energy, of course, you know, everything we talk about here in your podcast is about energy and fixing fatigue. And so it's critically important for, for men's energy. It has to do with bone health. It has to do with healthy metabolism. It has to do with brain function and focus and, and, and uh, performing your best at work. It has to do with long-term survival. Studies have shown that men with lower testosterone levels have a higher risk of prostate cancer, which is very counterintuitive, and earlier mortality. And so it's critically important that we realize that this is a massive crisis that's really not getting the attention it deserves. So the next question is, why is that happening? Yeah, great question. There are a lot of causes we can look at. You know, we have uh, chronic stress, which is raising cortisol, and that's crushing energy, as we know, it's crushing uh, testosterone and other hormones. We have uh, crummy nutrition. You know, we have the the, the sugar and the processed refined um, carbs that are uh, that have been shown to affect hormone levels. We have bad sleep. We know that crummy sleep raises cortisol, causes stress, but also lowers testosterone. All that aside, there's one much more important, one bigger player, and that answer is toxins, mm -hmm. endocrine disruptors, and so we have numerous studies that show the profound effect of endocrine disruptors. And so for the listeners, what is an endocrine disruptor? It is simply a toxin, chemical, chemical, uh, a chem toxicant, excuse me, that affects either hormone production, hormone function, re hormone receptor function, or blocks function. And so endocrine disruptors have been shown to have a profound effect on testosterone. So what are endocrine disruptors? Well, we have plastic water bottles. You know, I only drink from stainless steel water bottles and uh, I filter my water. There you go. So plastic water bottles, um, it's sprayed in our crops. 
uh, the herbicides, pesticides that are sprayed in our crops, it has been shown to affect our hormone production. We have plastic food containers. We have plastic lining metal cans. We have plastic um, around our, our, you know, milk, for example. So you have cows eating uh, these crops that are sprayed with pesticides, chemicals. The cows are injected with hormones, synthetic hormones and chemicals. And then the milk is put into these plastic lined boxes, cartons that we're drinking from. And so there's layer upon layer of endocrine disruption in the food and water that we're eating and drinking respectively. Personal care products, our deodorant, our cologne, our sunscreen, our shampoo, our soap, our laundry detergent, all these personal care products are loaded with chemicals that are clearly crushing testosterone. And so, you know, what do we do about it is obviously the next step. Well, it's awareness, it's understanding how do we avoid all this? How do we uh, avoid the, the, the estradiol in our drinking water? How do we avoid the plastics our, around our food? How do we choose the right personal care products? That's the first step. And then turning on or upregulating our body's detoxification systems to help us better clear those toxins that we're exposed to as well. Amen. Totally speaking my language. One of the things too, I'm curious if you've seen, I see a lot of, uh, when men come in with low testosterone, they're younger, oftentimes it's from mold toxicity. You seeing that as well? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and here we're, uh, you're bringing up a great point. We'll talk about systems approach in a minute, but it's important to understand that there are a lot of causes of it. You know, the, the, the real problem that I'm seeing in men's health specifically is there's a T clinic at every corner now. And, and guys think that all I got to do is go to the T clinic, get a shot every couple of weeks and I'm good to go. I'm fine. And, and that's a really big mistake to not dive deeper and understand what's the underlying cause. What's the physiologic process? What are the systems involved in really affecting that rather than just focusing on the low T and, and thinking that it's all about getting those levels up. Yeah. So let's shed some light on that. So then why, so then what's wrong with just going to the, the T clinic, getting your shot every week? What's wrong with that? Yeah. Because when we look at the, the human body, you know, we are complex. We're not complicated. First of all, we are complex in that everyone's uniquely different. Um, but we are this, uh, this symphony, if you will, of hormones. And so you can't look at testosterone as an isolated uh, part of the human system. So when a man has low testosterone, he often has low thyroid as well. He has low DHEA as well. He often has high cortisol. He often has elevated uh, fasting insulin levels with insulin resistance. He often has issues with inflammation. He often has issues with catabolic physiology. And he has all these other metabolic problems that are happening. And the low testosterone is not the cause of those problems. It's the symptom of those problems. Mm -hmm. And so you got to dive deeper and understand that if you're just getting a testosterone shot, you're just treating the symptom and all the other processes that are happening are still going on. And so that's where you got to, you know, I'm a medical doctor by background, just like you are, but this is where all the functional stuff comes into play. You got to understand what's going on when you look down to the, to the ultimate, you know, physiologic level of, of where the problems are. Yeah. And can you, can you get negative feedback mechanism? Can you shut things off if you are taking testosterone? Does that end up having some sort of negative effects? It does. You know, when you take testosterone, exogenous testosterone, it is going to, through negative feedback, turn off pituitary secretion of LH or luteinizing hormone. And so your body is going to sense, hey, I don't need to make any more tea. So at that point, then you do become reliant on testosterone. And so um, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but you need to be aware of that and understand that, that you need to then uh, either identify the underlying problems and correct them and or stay on testosterone long term at that point. Yeah. And I would imagine that, you know, taking testosterone doesn't work for everybody. Like there's a lot of people who are not going to get any results from it. And consequently, they need to be really shining a light over here. But there's there's probably a, a percentage. I don't know how much that get benefits from it. Right. And so it's if, unless they're actually looking unless they're actually looking forward and understanding that, hey, if I take this now, things are not going to go right for me in the future. But what, what have you seen in terms of people who actually benefit from getting the testosterone shot? Yeah, I see so many men who uh, come to me already on testosterone and they're miserable. They feel like crap. And like, I don't know why, like I thought it was just tea. I saw two guys today, with new, new patients today, the exact same story where T is not work. It's not doing what they wanted or thinking it was going to do. And so the reason for that, again, is that, that there are other underlying processes that are at play here. So when a guy presents with low energy and fatigue, 
and his T level is checked immediately by a, a physician says, oh, there you go, that's the problem and gives, gives him T, it, you got to recognize that there's chronic inflammation, there's infection, there's toxins, there's all these other things that are at play. And if you don't address those things, then he's still going to feel like crap. And so sure, some guys will definitely feel better initially. You know, you're again, we're treating a symptom when it comes to giving testosterone. But I like to go beyond, I, I call it going beyond testosterone, understanding that, that a systems approach is really how you need to address that. I love that. Beyond testosterone. Right. That's great. And so um, is there a place though for giving people testosterone? You know, sometimes we'll give people natural band-aids, even though we know that they're band-aids while we're fixing other things. And so that's kind of the first part of the question. The second part is if you are going to give somebody testosterone, do you give them a shot? Do you give them a cream? What do you like? Great question. There are pros and cons of each. So there are, are three routes generally of administration of testosterone. So there's, there's topical, there's injectable, and there are pellets, and they each have pros and cons. The topical is attractive for men who don't want to deal with needles or injections or procedures, and uh, that's applied daily. So if you, if you want to use topical cream, uh, you, you apply it on the scrotum, actually, because the absorption from the scrotum is, is amazing compared to other parts of the body. Um, but you got to put on every day. And so if you miss a day, your levels are in the tank because again, like you asked earlier, your body is suppressing normal production, knowing or thinking that it has all it needs. And so you got to do it every single day. So for some guys that's inconvenient, um, the, the common downside to topicals is that you don't want to um, uh, transmit that to someone else, especially your children. So, you know, if you, if you apply it, you got to make sure you wash your hands off before you touch anyone else or you could potentially transmit that to other people. Um, I don't think anyone else is going to be touching your scrotum that you need to worry about. So I think it's <laughs> more your hands, but, and I think that's really a theoretical risk. So, um, but otherwise it works great and guys like it. Um, with topical testosterone, you do tend to sometimes have higher DHT production. So DHT is dihydrotestosterone. And so sometimes hair loss can be a little more of an issue with topical than injectable, not much, but that, that can sometimes come up. Um, so that's topical. And then the injectable is uh, administered either sub Q or IM intramuscular, either way is actually effective. Um, and this is where we can get longer duration of, of therapy. So a guy can be on it, uh, getting injection every other day, twice a week, uh, once you get to once a week, you start to get more peaks and valleys and, and it goes, you know, swings throughout the week that I, I like to do at least twice a week. If you can, every other day is great. Every day would be ideal, but from a, a compliance standpoint, getting someone to inject themselves every day is, 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 is tends to be asking too much. So typically every, every other day, every, every third day or so is, is the um, typical route there. And um the downside to that is having to use a needle, having to, you know, remember to inject yourself on the, at those times. Um, otherwise it works great. You can get levels up to where you need them to be. You do need to monitor some labs periodically with that, but it's fairly safe. And, um, you know, the, the main downsides to testosterone um, are really misconceptions about cardiovascular health. You know, we know that Testosterone um, is actually vitally important when it comes to a uh, healthy uh, uh, vascular system and endothelial function. And studies have shown that guys with low testosterone have about a 30% increased risk of major adverse cardiac events and early mortality, actually. And it's very counterintuitive. There are two crummy studies that unfortunately came out about almost 10 years ago now that suggested the exact opposite. But when you actually looked at the data, we actually looked at the raw data, it actually supported exactly what we've known from every other study. And that is, uh, again, a protective effect when it comes to cardiovascular health. Um, there's also the issue of prostate cancer. We, we very clearly understand that testosterone does not cause prostate cancer. It has not been found to promote recurrence of cancer in men who have actually been treated with, who have no evidence of disease, who then are put on testosterone therapy as well. I've had numerous patients who actually have prostate cancer, low grade cancer, or following them with what's called active surveillance. And they're on testosterone with no progression of disease as well. And so from that standpoint, it's quite safe. Excellent. Yeah. I remember hearing about that book. Was it Abraham 
Morgan Taylor or something about, yes. you know, who was talking yes. about how it was more about the saturation. If the test, if the prostate was already saturated with testosterone where the levels weren't so low, right. Then right. You were at low risk. But if you were, if it was so low and you were going to increase it up, it potentially could cause the, the prostate cells to proliferate. Is that what, am I remembering that correctly? Exactly right. Yeah. Once you get up to testosterone level of around 200, give or take, you can go up in, in theoretically infinitely and um, the, those receptors are saturated to the point that you're not going to have any increased stimulation. Exactly right. Yeah. Okay. And since we're on the topic of testosterone, what about testosterone in women? I have seen, and I don't know if there's any research about it, but it seemed like potentially I had a patient who was having a TIA and we took her off the testosterone because there was some concern about blood clotting with it. How does it work with women differently? And are there, are there risks? I mean, yes, you talked about the cardio benefits. Are there any risks um, in terms of cardiovascular disease? No. So the short, okay. short answer is no. Yeah. So that, you know, there is this, so when we give to, uh, let me, let me start the first part of your question is for women, absolutely a huge benefit for women, especially when it comes to libido, when it comes to sense of vitality, uh, sex drive, uh, sexual performance, all that, um, it, it definitely comes into play with, uh, for that, for, um, workout capacity, um, exercise capacity as well. So it's very important for women as well. Um, we see a lot of postmenopausal women who get tremendous benefit from not just estradiol, but also from the testosterone as well. Um, now, in terms of the cardiovascular issue, you know, where that comes up is when we give testosterone, what it will do is it will stimulate the, the bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. Mm. That's a natural uh, cause or natural effect of testosterone. And so we will see in, in patients who are given testosterone therapy, we'll see a hemoglobin hematocrit level uh, rise over time. Mm. And so the, the theoretical risk has been, oh, well, if the hematocrit is over 50, 52, 55, whatever it may be, oh, there's a, there's a risk of sludging and the blood cells are going to you know, clump together. And there's this theoretical concern that there's going to be a stroke or a, a clot of some kind. There's actually remarkably never been a study that's ever shown that high hematocrit levels have any correlation with risk of heart attack, stroke, mm. or cardiovascular major adverse event. And you think about people who live at altitude, you think of people in, in the Alps or who live in Colorado, their hematocrit 60, 65, and there's no increased risk in these people. Uh -huh. And so it, it's, a, um, it's a misconception that even uh, myself as a urologist until about six, five, six years ago, I believed that as well. There was a huge risk and you got to do phlebotomy, you got to stop it. But um, it, there's really no data to support that at all. Excellent. That's definitely good to hear. So then for somebody who wants to boost their testosterone naturally, doesn't have access to somebody to prescribe or doesn't want a prescription, are there any natural alternatives that you found? Absolutely. You know, a lot of lifestyle stuff gets overlooked and I, I want to, um, I want to really pay homage to the fact that uh, there's a lot that we can do with nothing more than focusing on our uh, behavior. And, you know, this gets into epigenetics, which is how we can actually alter genetic expression. We can change our physiology simply by um, how we act, uh, how we behave, what we eat, how we breathe, even how we think even can affect genes. So one of the biggest ones is sleep. Um, most of the men who I work with, and I work with men and women, but predominantly men, um, most of the men have crummy sleep. And um, most of the time, that's by choice. It's, you know, I work with a lot of high performers and, and you know, they're, they're um, up late, working hard, grinding away, and, and they think that they do fine on four hours of sleep. I, I've heard the phrase over and over again, I'll sleep when I'm dead. I've heard like 10 times and times I've heard that. And I can't tell you how, how, how faulty that that thinking is because sleep is the critical time when our bodies are repairing itself and i know you appreciate the choir here i know you've talked about this on a lot of your other podcasts yeah it's, it's probably one of the most overlooked aspects of, of our health and how it relates to men's health and energy and testosterone is that as we know when you have crummy sleep it alters growth hormone production but also raises cortisol production and cortisol is chronic stress, basically raising cortisol. What does cortisol do? It crushes testosterone production. Mm. And so there's actually a study they looked at, at uh, uh, college kids, uh, university of Colorado they looked at college kids and they, they deprived them of sleep for a full 24 hours and their T levels dropped by 50% in one day. Crazy. Just from lack of sleep. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And so that's one of the, the first things we can do is really emphasize the profound effect that sleep has on testosterone. Um, you know, chronic stress as well. They, they, they kind of go hand in hand when guys are not taking the time to have a balanced lifestyle with relaxation, with uh, meditation, mindfulness, um, that sort of thing can really affect uh, them as well. So what I like to focus on is what's your nighttime routine. So let's say you're going to go to bed at 1030. Then you're going to set an alarm on your, on your phone and every night at 1030, you're going to bed. And for two hours before that, you can't use your phone, can't use your laptop, can't use your iPad, can't watch TV. So what can you do? Well, you can read a book, you can journal, you can meditate, or you can have sex. Those are basically the four best things I can think of for you to do during those last couple hours before you go to bed. And then 1030, you're in a relaxed, rested state, you're ready for bed. Um, and that nighttime routine is one of the most impactful ways that I can suggest that guys can improve uh, hormone levels. Um, we know that strength training, specifically large muscles are really important for, for testosterone as well. So uh, strength training is w- much, much more important and valuable than endurance or, or aerobic training. And so, uh, you know, squats and lunges and back exercise, all the big muscle bellies are the ones that you want to really focus on those core muscles and, and legs uh, specifically are going to be the most important when it comes to strength training. Um, And then diet, you know, the, the, the evils of our societies, you know, sugar and the, the vegetable oil, seed oils, uh, those omega-6 pro-inflammatory oils, Um, getting those out of your diet, um, I I think is super important. Um, uh, The other part of of diet is um, when it comes to fat, there is this misconception that fat's evil. I know you've talked about this as well, but I want to just emphasize this, that, that to make testosterone, there is this steroid pathway that, that you and I learned in medical school that most of your listeners did not have to memorize. We did. <laughs> and, and this steroid biosynthesis pathway to produce testosterone and estradiol, you go above that, you get to DHEA, you go above that, you get to pregnenolone, you go above pregnenolone. What is the initial precursor of testosterone? It is cholesterol, exactly. And so you need cholesterol to make testosterone. And so um, a lot of folks will try to get on these, you know, super low fat diets. You need healthy fats, you need cholesterol to make testosterone. Um, And so uh, obviously diet, obviously stress, obviously fitness, obviously sleep all really come into play when we're looking at optimizing testosterone. And I mentioned no drugs right there. (laughs) Yeah, no, that was brilliant. And so consequently, statins, right, are like the anti-testosterone. Exactly right. That's right. Yeah, we, we need that good fat. That was, that was perfect. Um, I've had some success with um, some herbs like maca that can increase testosterone. Any herbs that you've seen that are especially helpful? Yeah, you know, uh, maca is okay. Um, Tongkat Ali is okay. Um, there are, um, God, there, I used to make a testosterone booster and I know there's a bunch of them out there and I honestly quit making it. Because the, the, the data is, and I made it because so many patients asked for it. And I'm like, I'll put together the best ones out there. And in reality, I, I didn't feel ethically right about it because the, the, they're just okay. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I feel like the, the data is not really strong enough that I can support it. Um, I think that the, the lifestyle stuff we talked about, um, and I'll also emphasize that, you know, a lot of these guys who come in with a, a testosterone of 200 and you do all these natural lifestyle things, you do herbs, you do all this um, non-medicational approaches, you're going to get them up to from 200 to let's say 400. You're going to get their free from five up to 12. I need them to be three times higher than that, two times, you know, twice at that level. And so that's where most of the time you end up having to give these guys testosterone. You try all the natural stuff first. Don't get me wrong. I don't don't want to minimize that. But most of the time to really get guys where they need to be, um, you end up having to get them testosterone, at least until you can dive deeper and spend time fixing those underlying, um, you know, uh, levels of inflammation and insulin resistance and so on. Excellent. Yeah. So let's go there next. I definitely want to get into genetics, but maybe we talk about the systems approach now where you kind of bring all this stuff in. Yeah, sure. So the, there are a couple of different analogies I use when I talk about this. The, the one that I think is, is easiest to visualize is a bicycle wheel. And you have all these spokes of your wheel Mm. and the center of that wheel can be sexual function. It could be energy. It could be your ideal weight. It could be a a brain focus, whatever, whatever target or goal you have, 
you have these spokes of your wheel and uh, we have broken spokes. Now those spokes can be testosterone, thyroid, you know, DHEA, all the you know, 20 hormones we look at. It could be your gut health. It could be your neurotransmitters. It could be infections. It could be mold. It could be parasites and, and all the other diseases and, Ill, and, and infections that you deal with a lot. It can be crummy sleep. It could be stress. All these different aspects of our health are inputs to our human operating system, so to speak. And you need to identify which of, the, of your spokes, if you will, are broken. Because when they're broken, that wheel is not going to work properly. You're going to have an, an, an out of balance wheel, so to speak. And so I, I like to think of it as identifying the areas of your health that need attention and then really diving deep on those. When you fix that, there's going to be another spoke that needs attention. And so um, it's understanding that, that for your human system to function properly, it's never one spoke. It's never just testosterone. It's never just your gut. There's so many aspects to it. And that's what's fun. That's what, that's what you know, I, 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 I love what I do. And it, it's almost like a, um, like a mystery to identify what are the inputs, what are the broken spokes that we need to affect. Yeah, that's brilliant. You know, I found that there's 33 different causes and that everybody has a combination of 20 of them, 20 plus. There we go. Causes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Never just one. Yeah. Never just one. Yeah. Excellent. I love that analogy. So then let's talk about genetics. How do we incorporate genetics into this? Sure. So I, I find that there is this, um, this, this mistake of assuming that a one size fits all model works and it doesn't because we're all uniquely different our genetics dictate how we respond to things so let me give you an example i see guys who come in all the time and they're on keto diet and they're like yeah i'm not losing any weight but i'm doing the keto diet you know because i'll ask them about their nutrition of course and there are genetics that uh, that help us understand how your body processes food nutrition helps us understand what you should eat, what you shouldn't eat, um, what micronutrient deficiencies might you have the potential for, uh, what areas of, of, uh, of toxin exposure might you be more susceptible to, uh, what, uh, what might be more um, dangerous for your mitochondrial function, or what exercises are right for you, what hormone issues might we need to look at. And so we can use genetics um, to look at all those things. So a lot of guys will come in and uh, we'll run their genetics and I'll find that um, they would actually lose weight, build muscle, burn fat, feel better with higher complex carb intake, mm. higher, which is counterintuitive to the common thinking. Oh, I just need low carb. And that's, that's all I need for some people. That's great for many others. It's the wrong approach. Um, we have genetics that look at micronutrient deficiencies. Um, I'll give you an example the, the BCMO gene. This is a gene that looks at how our bodies processes, how, how we process vitamin A. So vitamin A, typically you eat beta carotene, it gets converted into, into a palmitic or retinoic acid, which is the active biologic form of vitamin A. Well, the BCMO gene is what, uh, what makes that conversion happen. If you have a variant of that gene, you will not convert beta carotene into retinoic acid. And so you need to supplement specifically with the active form of vitamin A because your body can't use beta carotene like other people can. Mm. Um, we may find that your mitochondria are, are potentially more susceptible than others. And so perhaps for you, you may need additional supplementation. Maybe you need additional detox support to help you with the toxins. Maybe IL-6 is going to be higher in you because of toxin exposure. So we can use supplementation to help alleviate that. Um, we can use genetics to understand what type of exercise is right for you. And so there's a lot of fine tuning, you know, we have general guidelines, general recommendations we were talking about earlier, of how we can improve our health and how we can improve testosterone, but we can dive deeper and have very specific personalized recommendations based on genetics. Excellent. So I struggle with this a little bit because you talked a little bit about epigenetics, you know, where you've got the gene, but the gene may not be turned on. So how do you yeah. know if somebody actually needs that active form of vitamin yeah. A, you know, if they have the gene, but it may not be turned on? Yeah, great question. I'll give you an example of that. So we can look at the APOE gene, for example. So APOE is apolipoprotein E, and this is a gene that has to do with how our bodies process saturated fat. And so certain variants, APOE4 is what it's called, or a, and that's either APOE3, 4, or 4, 4, depending on what, whether you have one or two alleles that, that, um, that give you that gene. So we know that, that people with the APOE4 variant 
will have a, a markedly 12 times increased risk of early cardiovascular disease, early onset dementia, Alzheimer's disease with saturated fat intake. And so it's something where we know that that's a susceptibility, that's genetics, okay? So genetics tell us that you were at increased risk of developing um, these bad issues, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, dementia. However, if you limit your saturated fat intake, your saturated fat intake to under 5% or less of your daily cal caloric intake, studies have shown that that risk completely disappears hmm. and that your risk is no different than the average population. And so that's epigenetics. So what I mean by that is understanding your genetics helps you make lifestyle decisions, which directly impacts that gene's expression. And so that's really how epigenetics and genetics comes into play, how we can use the genetic information to understand what we can do differently in our lifestyle and our behavior, what we eat, et cetera, to, to have an impact. That's a great example. I think the, um, the challenges that I still have with this, and we're going to, you know, hopefully, um, yeah, we can we kind of hash this out a little bit. Maybe you can yeah. shed some light on this for me, is that there are some things like the APOE 404 or the APOE that has good research on it. And then there's, you know, we, we know a lot of genes, but we don't know, we don't have a lot of research on those genes. So then how do you extrapolate that information? Or then does then it become more about the environment and you're looking at these toxins anyway, and you're removing them. And consequently through epigenetics, you're improving the way that these pathways are functioning or how do you like to do that? Yeah. Yeah. Great, great point. And there's a lot of both. And, and there's a ton of science out there. You look at, um, you can go online and there are several sites that'll show you tons of data um, I went through an epigenetic certification program actually uh, uh, about four years ago now, uh, Apiron, and the data on the genes that I look at uh, is very robust, and there's real science behind it at a basic science level as well as at a population level, um, shows the impact there. But th there's a lot of, um, of, you know, based on this gene, uh, this gene profile, I should say, it's typically never one gene equals one outcome. It's typically an algorithm where, you know, these 10 genes together tell us that you're at increased risk of having um, a higher inflammatory response to toxins. And so therefore you may want to use quercetin or curcumin or more NMN or more sauna use specifically because of that, for example. Um, and so that's where it comes into play is understanding what your blind spots are and how you could potentially affect that a lot of times full transparency, you're going to know that and you're going to do things, but then you're not going to have an immediate gratification to know that what you did immediately worked. Mm -hmm. I would say the delayed gratification would be that you live longer and healthier, but you're not <laughs> going to recognize that right then and there. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that makes a lot of sense. You know, when it comes down to it, like so much of this is about getting the data that you need, right? And if you can get a little bit of data from each one of these components, you know, you're just that much more, you're going to be that much more successful because you can fix so many more of those spokes on that yeah. wheel. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit about... Um, peptides. Tell us, like, what are peptides? These are relatively new for a lot of folks. Make yeah. us more familiar with them and how, and how you use them. Yeah, peptides are truly amazing. So um, peptides are nothing more than short proteins. So a protein is simply a chain of amino acids linked together, very specific sequence. If you have more than 100 amino acids in length, it's a protein. If you have less than 100 amino acids in length, it's a peptide. It's literally that simple. Um, a peptide is um, really a signaling molecule, if you will. It's an enzyme, if you will. It's used for very specific purposes, very specific uh, functions. And they're signals that the body already recognizes because they come from our own body. So, for example, insulin is a peptide. Growth hormone is a peptide. Um, one of the common ones we use um, to, to help explain it is it would be to give an example, BPC-157. This is probably one of the most commonly known peptides out there right now. Um, BPC-157 is a body protective complex and um, 157, and it comes from, uh, it's, a it's a chain of 15 amino acids in length, and it derives from the stomach. From the enzymes of our stomach, they found that, that this short pr protein called a peptide, has amazing anti-inflammatory effects. And so it reduces inflammation in the GI tract and the gut specifically. It also has amazing uh, anti-inflammatory effects in joints. 
or even systemically. So it could be given either orally or uh, as a sub-Q injection to reduce inflammation. Uh, thymus and alpha is another uh, peptide that comes from the thymus gland, has amazing benefits when it comes to immune function, and uh, it um, uh, upregulates T reg cell function, which is part of our T cell immunity. And um, I got in trouble <laughs> from FTC because I talked about the amazing benefit that thymus and alpha has on our immune system. And I simply used it when I got sick with an infection a couple of years ago. That's all I said. And apparently FTC didn't like that. And I got in trouble, despite the fact that a month later, an article in PubMed talked about how amazing thymus and alpha was at treating COVID. So then it was okay, but I wasn't, I, I wasn't allowed to say it before then. Um, that's a brief aside, but um, but amazing uh, immune function benefits thymus and alpha. Again, it, these are um, um, peptides that come from the human body. So we have peptides that are amazing for um, reducing inflammation, for uh, immune function, for musculoskeletal repair. Thymus and beta is one. Again, it comes from the uh, derived from the human body. Um, I had elbow surgery six weeks ago yesterday, and I used thymus and beta as a way to improve the musculoskeletal repair. Um, after that surgery. So it's great for uh, post-operative, you have arthritis, uh, you know, knee pain, shoulder, elbows, that sort of stuff. There are peptides that are great for sleep. There are peptides that are great for weight loss, peptides that help boost our natural growth hormone production. You know, once we hit 40, it all falls apart, right? Growth hormone levels decline by about 1% a year. And that's a big reason why we fall apart. And so wouldn't it be great if we can help our body produce natural, healthy, optimal, ideal levels of growth hormone without having to take it exogenously, which has a lot of downsides and consequences and negatives. And so there are peptides that help stimulate our pituitary gland to, to produce the normal levels that our body needs. Um, so there are peptides for almost anything you can imagine, for, um, for sexual function, for hair loss, for skin rejuvenation, for longevity. Um, Epidolon is a peptide that's simply two amino acids in length. It's been shown in animal studies, no human studies yet. Animal studies have shown um, increased lifespan with epidolon. Nice. And so we're on the cutting edge. Um, uh, new peptides are being uh, discovered and developed and studied uh, on a daily basis. And it's a really exciting area in regenerative medicine when we look at ways of, of optimizing our health without relying simply on pharmaceuticals and drugs. Excellent. And it sounds like there's, there's research on peptides, mainly on animals, also on humans. What are you seeing with some of the other ones like BPC-157? Yeah, like both. There's studies on both. There's a lot of, of bench work uh, done at, you know, in, the, in the laboratory on these peptides. And then there's a fair amount of data. The, um, some peptides are still uh, animal studies only, take at your own risk. And others have tons of human studies. Thymus and alpha has been around for 20 years. Tons of human studies has been used in, in other um, um, human illnesses before with long-term data there. Um, every peptide is a little different. And, and that's where I want to just put an asterisk next to this whole discussion and, um, and bookmark it with um, a caution to the listeners that this is not something to take lightly. This is not a supplement like some of the vitamins and herbs that you can get you know, off the shelf or on Amazon. And there are places where you can go um, online direct to consumer and purchase peptides, but I never ever recommend that you go to a place like that. Um, from a quality assurance standpoint, from a purity standpoint, you have no idea what you're getting. Um, when I work with patients, I individualize it, I tailor it based on their needs, and I prescribe only from reputable uh, compounding pharmacies where I can I can get you know certificates of authentic authenticity and you know confirm that their product is legit. So a uh, word of caution to the listeners out there when you get excited about peptides. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And oral versus injectable, is oral as good? It, you know, it, great question. It depends on what you're trying to do. So uh, BPC, for example, is oral, but the, uh, and that's great for the gut, for gut health. I've had so many men who um, have irritable bowel issues, reflux issues, cramping, and um they um, have remarkable improvement with nothing but BPC. If they don't, you got to look for infections and, and SIBO and, and, you know, other issues going on. But for a lot of guys, it's amazing for reducing inflammation for the gut. If you're looking to reduce joint inflammation, sub-Q injection is needed. If you're looking for reducing systemic inflammation, either oral or sub-Q is effective. Um, it depends on the peptide. Uh, C-Link is a great peptide for anxiety. That's actually a nasal spray. 
Um, there's a peptide that is uh, topical um, when we're looking at, at uh, focus, concentration, brain power. Um, so it depends on, on what peptide we're looking at, uh, whether you're going to administer it uh, sub-Q or topical, nasally, orally, whatever. Excellent. Yeah. So last two questions before I let you go. Thank you so much for sharing all this knowledge with us and our audience. Really appreciate it. So you are, you've used a lot of different biometric devices from what I can remember. Do you have a favorite? I'm currently using the Aura Ring. Um, so I'm curious about your opinion about that, but what, what are you typically, what are you using these days for biometric uh, evaluation? Yeah, great question. I normally myself use Garmin, um, but I'll say that there are, again, pros and cons to all the different devices. I, I try to be agnostic. Uh, Whoop is, has really made a big move lately uh, that they've really improved their platform. Um, but Aura and Garmin and Whoop would probably be the top three. Um, and then BioStrap Fitbit would be a little lower than that. Um, Apple would be below that as well when it, when, when it comes to the actionable data that you get. Um, I like Aura, you know, they changed to a subscription model, which kind of uh, uh, upset a lot of people uh, from a cost perspective, which was a new change for them. Uh, that same data, now you're just paying for it every month instead of getting it, we, we, you had to buy the, the ring and pay, buy the subscription now, which is a little different. Um, I find that the sleep data for Aura is fantastic. I find that some of the other data is better on the Garmin. Um, especially if you're looking at activity and recovery, HRV, that sort of stuff. I, I think the Garmin is probably a little better there. Uh, Whoop is great at looking at recovery status and, um, and that sort of stuff more for uh, the athletes. Um, so it's, again, I, I try to be agnostic and, and what device are you going to wear consistently? Uh, I've, I have a race car driver as a client and he will not wear a ring. He'll wear a strap, but he won't wear a ring. So for him, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, talk about Whoop or, or, um, or Garmin. Other guys will not wear a watch. Now we got, you know, so it's really what, what are you going to be uh, compliant with is really the key. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't want to, I didn't want to watch and I wanted something that was going to get my yeah. HRV. There you go. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's pretty good. You know, it's, there, there's some variability there, but I think if you use it consistently, the, the key thing I want to emphasize there with things like HRV and for the listener, heart rate variability, it's a, a physiologic surrogate for stress levels. It's not the absolute number. It's what is what's causing it to dramatically go up, dramatically go down. What are you doing right? What are you doing wrong? Kind of things, and don't care so much about the absolute number because that, that doesn't really matter quite as much. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. So then, last question is: Where can people learn more about this wonderful work that you're doing? Where would you like them to uh, to go? Oh, sure. So um, I have a gift for your listeners. If you're okay with that, Doc, please. Yeah, sure. So um, if the listeners will text the word health to 26786, again, it's health to 26786. Um, I'm going to give you all a couple gifts. One is going to be a complimentary copy of my best selling book, Mail 2.0. And I'm also going to include with that a uh, free copy of my Secrets to High Performance Health, which will kind of give you some, some basic starting points on how you can get going in this area of, of high performance health that I, I find so amazing. Um, and then I'm also going to include details of my live event in Sarasota, Florida, which will be coming up June 11th and June 12th called the Gavin Institute Performance Health Summit. First live event here locally. It's going to be amazing. Um, and then I'll also include a link for a discovery call with my team. If you want to learn how we can help uh, any individual here listening, um, how we can help you, uh, you know, understand where you are now, where you want to be, and how we can hopefully help you. Excellent. And this is not just for men. This is not for men. We work with men and women, um, high-performing executives, entrepreneurs, athletes, business owners, uh, anyone who's successful who really wants to upgrade their health, upgrade their life. Love it. Such good work that you're doing. Dr. Tracy, thanks so much for hanging out with me today. Thanks, Evan. I appreciate it, man. I hope you learned something on today's podcast. If you did, please share it with your friends and family and leave us a five-star review on iTunes. It's really helpful for getting this information out to more fatigued people who desperately need it. Sharing all the experts I know and love and the powerful tips I have on fatigue is one of my absolute favorite things to do. If you'd like more information, please sign up for my newsletter where I share all important facts and information about fatigue. 
from the foods and supplements to the programs and products that I use personally and recommend to others so that they can live their best lives. Just go to fixyourfatigue.com forward slash newsletter to sign up and I will send you this great information. Thanks for being part of my community. Just a reminder, this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not a substitute for professional care by a doctor or other qualified medical professional. It is provided with the understanding that it does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. If you're looking for help with your fatigue, you can visit my website and work with us at fixyourfatigue.com. And remember, it's important that you have someone in your corner who is a credentialed healthcare professional to help you make changes. This is very important, especially when it comes to your health. Thanks for listening.